one of my stitches just released because my titties were like, that was the best thing I've ever tasted. <laughs> we can't really tell each other how much we love each other. I can do it through my tone. I want something sexy. That's L-I-Q-U-O-R. Don't get it twisted. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Kitty Liquor. That's L-I-Q-U-O-R. Don't get it twisted. I'm your host, Cat Wonders, and this is episode 135. Right? <laughs> Let me triple check. I'm sure it is. Yes. So last episode, um, the way that it works is I'll film, upload, uh, and then have my editor edit, and then he'll upload, and then sometimes... <laughs> I just, I've done my task for the day and I don't write it down necessarily. And I miss posting the video on the day that it uploads. Like I try to upload as soon as possible. It was supposed to go up. Last episode was supposed to go up four days before or three days before it was uploaded. Um, sorry, before I uploaded it finally. Uh, so <laughs> I was like, damn it. I hate being late with things anyway, but especially when they're ready to go. And then I upload them late. I'm like, damn it. But anyway. It's all good. It's uploaded. It, my bad. Apologies for that. Uh, I was supposed to go up Saturday. It went up Tuesday today, the day that I'm filming this. So that's what's going on. Normally I'll like pitch a warning and be like, hey, I'm going to be late posting this video or whatever. It just completely slipped my mind. Oopsies. So sorry about that. Um, I also do like the majority of things on my own. So I have a big list of things to do. And in my mind, I was like pretty calm about how the tasks were completed and they just weren't, <laughs> not all of them, most of them, but not all of them. So hopefully that won't happen again. Okay. First things first, I saw an ad on Facebook for something called a stitchy. And once I clicked on that ad, so many more ads were popping up and I decided to buy something called a Stitchy, but I'm not dumb enough to order it through the Facebook link. The Facebook link, sorry, any ads on Facebook, you cannot trust unless it's taking you directly to a reputable website. Do not buy anything off Facebook. If you're scrolling, something pops up, it looks cool. Do not do it. I've tried multiple times uh, and every time, if the thing shows up, um, is either completely different from the item that was advertised, or like I said, it doesn't show up at all. I have a horrific, but I mean, it was amended, but <sighs> I have a horrific story, a Facebook purchase story I'll share after this. So instead of buying the stitchy, through this website because I was glad I didn't buy it through this website because I saw it again called the Stitchy on another website. And then there was another advertisement for another website to buy this thing, the Stitch Gun. What is the Stitch Gun? Basically, it's a little gun that you use to, if I wanted to close my blouse, which I'm about to display to you exactly how this thing works, um, you can just take a little gun, which is got a needle on it so it doesn't damage your fabrics and it it stitches it closed you can have you can stitch your collars open basically it allows you to kind of it allows you to customize your clothing the way that you want it to be customized but in a temporary kind of like if I want to do this if I want to close my blouse it'll let me do it for the day and I can just go like this pop pop it open and then I can decide if I want to actually stitch it closed in that place. But sometimes you can't because then you can't get the garment on. If I were to stitch this right here closed, then I couldn't get it off. So I'll explain. I went on Amazon and I did not know what this thing was called. So I typed in uh, stitchy on amazon.ca and a bunch of different things popped up. And then I found these guns that are used, like a stitch gun that's used to um, put tags on clothing. So, but all the stitch, the tags were like this long. I knew it had to be something very small because from, from what I could see in the advertisement, it was like almost micro. You can't see it. 
So after some digging, I discovered the Stitchy. It is feather light packable, which is very important because some of these little stitches and stuff are gonna have to be taken apart, ripped off, um, and then reapplied. So this way, it's not like a five pound thing that I can't pack with me. So basically, how many times have I said basically already in this podcast? Um, these are the little stitches that it comes with. So mine came with a bazillion of these. I think like 5,000 clear ones, which these are clear, white clear, and 5,000 black ones. This little gadget is amazing. So here's the gun. You pop off the end, and as you can see, just got this little needle. And the way it works is you thread this in, hear it? And then the gun just punches a little tag through, hold on a sec. So, okay, here's how it works. It took a little bit of getting used to, and sometimes I'll pull the trigger and the stitch doesn't go through. So it takes a couple times, the odd time. So in this case, I want to kind of close my blouse a little bit, right? You guys are gonna hate this thing after I use it, but. <laughs> uh, so I wanna kind of close it, say to about there. Take your stitchy, put it through both sides, pull the trigger, and it creates a little stitch and it holds the clothes together, uh, the fabric together. I think for me, I'll probably do two just because, oh, see, so now the only w thing is, is that if you don't use it multiple times consecutively, sometimes it can get kind of jammed. All I do is like lift it out, put it back in a couple times to the bottom. And that usually does the trick. So let me try that again. Nope, let me try it again. Okay, that time it did. So just a couple to be extra secure. It's that simple. And can you see what's going on? Maybe because it's being pulled apart, you could see the actual stitch. But if I wanted to, um, a lot of times I order t-shirts or shirts, dress shirts that I want the collar to remain open a little bit. Um, I don't like it when you have a structured collar on a shirt, it stays closed, but I like the relaxed look of it, like being breezy and open. This works perfectly. Um, I roll the sleeves up on my t-shirts. Um, it just has a more feminine look, less boxy. Um, this would be perfect. And they just literally pop open. Like imagine, I'll get one of these out. Let's see if I can do it. So I'll try to show you the little end broke off, but can you see the little, oh, it's essentially a little eye, the shape of a little eye. Um, and anyway, this is not sponsored. I just thought this is a really cool gadget and it is saving me a lot of not wearing items because of certain things I don't like about them. This fixes those certain things. Also to keep your bra strap um, like tucked into your shirt where it w w like has a tendency to fall over. These are not necessarily issues that my 99.9% .9 followers are male will have. But if you have a collar that you want a little more open, or if you have, you want to keep your tie in the center of your, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily, it's a pretty decent sized needle. So not like a silk tie, but there are things you can do. And this, just imagine where, what you can stitch. <laughs> so this is something I found on Amazon. It's called a micro stitch gun. If you type that in, you can find this exact one. Um, I would recommend this one because some of them have longer stitches. But anyway, that was like 10 minutes of me selling a product that I'm not making any money on. But that's fine because I don't make money on this podcast anyway. Actually, that's not true. I do make money if I do have a, a sponsorship, which I haven't for a long time. 
but also certain liquor companies will send me free booze. So that saves me money in turn making me money, if you think about it. So today I went crazy at the liquor store. I uh, stopped by, so I have a little routine, the odd day of the week when I haven't had breakfast, but it's the afternoon and I'm in town. I'll swing by McDonald's. I will get a filet of fish patty with a side of tartar sauce. That is like the best brunch. <laughs> um, sometimes I get two filet of fish patties, but um, they're not super, I mean, they're not low calorie, but there's not a ton of carbs. And even though it's breaded and kind of deep fried, it doesn't never, it never affects me, my stomach or my bowels or anything because I don't eat wheat. Um, so a, a filet of fish patty or two, a side of tartar sauce and an iced coffee. And, um, on the way home, I passed by the liquor store and I was like, oh, I need to pick up a couple things. And I'm like, oh, I have to film my podcast. So what do I want to try? And I, I was like looking for something very different and I found it. And I hope that what I create today will get a name and it will be a recipe in the description box down below <laughs> because only the really good, interesting, creative, tasty cocktails that I make on this podcast, make it into the description box. And it's been a while. So let me show you what I got. Look at this sunshine in a bottle. This is rum chata limon. Basically, so rum chata is like a coconut, the, the original bottle. The only one that I've ever tried is the coconut liqueur, creamy coconut liqueur. So delicious in coffees and just everything, just on its own or in things. And uh, I never realized that there is a lemon version or a limon. Um, so it's a cream liqueur. Rum chata limon combines rum with sweet cream, vanilla, and lemon in a sweet cream liqueur with a bright lemon finish. <sighs> this is sort of like, it's funny because you don't really think of citrus and cream together because if you were to actually put citrus and cream together, it will break and split and basically curdle. So this is very interesting to me. And I did open it and have a little sip of it because I was like, will this work? So here's my idea. I'm gonna use some of this and one ounce of this. And then I'm gonna use one ounce of this Malibu coconut rum coconut flavored liqueur. And this has been a favorite of mine since I can remember, <laughs> since my childhood, but only because it's so sweet and like, this fresh bottle by the way, it smells like, <laughs> when I was a kid, I used to go to Sylvan Lake and it was the one time of year that I'd look forward to so much. And as I became a teenager and kind of got more into tanning and I would buy the Hawaiian Tropic coconut body oil. Never ever do this by the way, because I am a very, very white Canadian girl and putting, <laughs> I learned my lesson multiple times. Does that make sense? No, because if you learn your lesson once, you don't do it again. <laughs> but the smell of this, this body oil was like my memory, is my memory of Sylvan Lake. And Sylvan Lake used to be a lot different. Um, a lot of you don't know where that is, or it's it's in Alberta near Red Deer, um, and, or near Edmonton, <laughs> in Alberta. And they used to have, Sylvan Lake used to have a great big water park, really fun water park, um, great ice cream shops, a nice beach, but over the years, like the last 10 years, um, the beach has not receded, but it's, they filled the lake level apparently um, because of, I guess, they discovered new species of fish and the lake level was too low to maintain the species. So the beach has disappeared. So the sand beaches disappeared. They also demolished the water park to build condos. Now, biggest mistake ever, but I do feel like that <laughs> the last few years that we were on the, uh, I'm like leaning into the microphone. Um, the last few years we spent at Sylvan Lake, um, 
our shoulder blades and tailbones were red and bruised from the the seams in the water slide were kind of a bit off. <laughs> so like worst nightmare. Um, it, event, it was worn down and kind of like decrepit and it was time for it to go. So, but I'm glad that my entire child, not my entire, but like for at least a good amount of my childhood, I had memories there and, you know, nothing good lasts forever. Um, you know, it's sad that it's gone, but I have the memories. So that's all that matters. But this smell, that was a long story <laughs> from smelling this, smells identical to those years that I spent in Sylvan Lake. Uh, we used to rent cabins or rent a cabin and then multiple family members would come stay with us too. So we'd be with our cousins, cousins sometimes and oh, just so, so great. So this is my plan. One ounce of this, one ounce of this. And then... <laughs> I got this Snapple spiked peach tea. Peach, coconut, lemon, I'm thinking is going to be a good combination. This is also 5.5% alcohol vodka. So I have to be careful. <laughs> Maybe what I'll do is one ounce of the rum chata limon, half an ounce of the coconut vodka, and this, and since this is not carbonated, I can shake all of this together. Let me try this on its own. That's really good. It's also not sugar-free by any means. But do you notice how like iced tea creates this dry feeling on the back of your tongue and the back of your throat? What is that? This is gonna be spectacular. And if it is, I hope you can get all of these ingredients where you live. But I'm not gonna get ahead of myself. I'm going to make this cocktail and we're gonna come up with a funky name and put it in the description box, like I said. So I've got my, let me just pour the water out into my mouth. Okay, there's about half a shot of water in there. That's how I measure things now. It's like a full shot, half a shot. Um, let's do this. So we've got our... <laughs> our shot measurer. So let's do half an ounce of this first. Of the... Half an ounce of the coconut the Malibu rum, the coconut rum. Half an ounce in. Then. One ounce of this. Now have a look at how beautiful this stuff is. It's definitely not yellow like the outside of the bottle. And then let's just guess how much of this is going to make a full glass. Let's stop there. Um, oh yeah, right here. This time you guys, I remembered a glass and a straw. Let's shake this puppy up and then I did bring an actual lemon. I'm not gonna use it though, because I do not have a knife. And I decided I'm gonna use a dehydrated lemon wedge instead. Let's do this. Basically shake it till your hand is numb. It's Frothy? I did not expect that. You guys want to be part of this action. So let me just bring it closer and hopefully not spill it on myself. No! <laughs> the foam. I'm using the wrong thing. 
just making unnecessary dishes, but I'm gonna have to pull out this good old unit. This is better. How do I use this again? I mean, how good at guessing am I? So this looks so creamy and delicious, like it could be an eggnog cocktail, <laughs> but it ain't. Oh my God, you guys, oh, can you smell? <laughs> One day it's gonna be possible where I'm gonna hold this up to another special microphone looking thing where you can smell it at home. It'll like read the chemical compounds of the odor and you'll be able to smell, smell a vision. Let's take one of these and just stick it in the foam because it's that thick. <gasps> Actually, if I was smart, I would just lay it on top, but I think that's, that's fine. You get the gist. I'm not, you know, trying to really impress anybody. That's not true. That's all I try to do is impress people. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> so here we go. Let's see if this works. One of my stitches just released because my titties were like, that was the best thing I've ever tasted. <laughs> wow. How do I describe this? Okay. So creamy. <laughs> creamy, refreshing. I get the iced tea coming through. I get the lemon and the coconut is making it kind of like more, more creamy tasting. It's strange because it's not coming from this. It's coming from that. If this was like frozen blended, like, um, a pina colada. But this is so different, it's so delicious. I knew it, I knew that it was gonna be good. But the, the peach iced tea in with this is making this whole thing spectacular. I'm gonna get emotional and cry, no, I'm just joking. I can't cry this many episodes in a row. Um, wow, okay, so what do I call this? Let me just take another sip and just get in my head. There's vanilla and lemon and coconut. This is like, oh, this is like Palm Springs. I'm gonna call this <laughs> Palm Royale. <laughs> no, that, that's the show that I'm watching. The weather is feeling a little palmy. That's the name, no. <laughs> um, I'm gonna call it Coconut Palms Delight. It's the Coconut Palms Delight. It almost feels like Coconut Palms is a name of a hotel. Coconut Palms Delight. And life's peachy, but we're gonna leave the peach out of it. Coconut Palms Delight. Let me write it down. Delight is the word. It's like, it's kind of covering all those bases. My friend has a broken bone. We suspected it, but now it's confirmed. <laughs> so, friend fell the other day in an auto body shop by tripping over like a, a hoist and then fell, braced himself. And I don't know if it broke then, but then the next day went for a bike ride and flew off his bike and then probably made it worse. And since has been just doing 
everything that normally, but he should have really been in a splint. So what can I say? <laughs> oh, well, it's just a broken hand. Let me just, I got to console here. Okay. So I already forgot the name, but it's okay. I wrote it down. Coconut Palm Delight. Delicious. It's definitely a delight. So how many of you saw the Northern Lights? <laughs> it's been all over every social media, the news. And I have never in my 20 years of living here in the Rockies, I've never seen the Northern Lights. I've heard people talk about them. I hear about them after they've happened. And I'm always like, damn it. Like I've always wanted to see them. And the the image that I already like always had in my head, and I know there's like different, you know, um, intensities of Northern Lights, but I kind of like had it in my head. I've seen Northern Lights on videos, photos, uh, my whole life, um, usually like in Alaska, and they're like dancing in the sky, and they're like neon green or purple, or, and uh, I never really believed that those photos or videos weren't like enhanced in some way they just look it just doesn't look real and um so <laughs> i was scrolling on facebook i think right after dinner or something and somebody had posted that i somebody that i know posted that there was the strong forecast for the aurora borealis uh that night um, so I was like, oh, okay, well I'll keep an eye out and see. Um, so I kept kind of like, it got, it was getting dark and I've never seen them and I've always been so close, but I, so I just kind of convinced myself that it, I would never see them. Like, <laughs> just like it's been 20 years. I've never, it's like since I've lived where I live now. And anyway, so around, like when it was officially dark, I could kind of see a little something happening and but never really, I was like, oh, okay, well, it looks like a streak of this, but it was like a very white, faint line in the sky. And then kind of went out again, couldn't see anything else, went back inside, doing my thing, go check it out again. And I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm starting to see more lights in the sky, but I can't really, it's no color or anything like that, nothing distinct. And then I go back inside and I'm like, kind of just thinking, well, that, that was probably it. Like, I, you know, where, where we live, like maybe you just can't see it as well. I go back outside and I look up and it's what looks like a really angry chicken in the sky. <laughs> Basically, you know, those chickens with a lot of feathers around their face and they look like Beethoven. They kind of have like, that's what it looked like. But I could barely see color. I could see if I looked away, I could see in the my peripheral a bit of color. It's like it's like you can't see it when if you look directly at it, but if you look next to it, you can kind of see it. Um, but it just literally looked like there was a beak and like full feathers around. And I thought that's funny. So I stood and I looked and watched, and I didn't have my glasses on, and I thought, okay. Is it moving? Is it not? So I would really have to stare at one spot very intently to see it move. And wow, was it ever moving? But I didn't see vivid colors. I just saw streaks of light. And I was excited. I was like, I'm actually seeing the Northern Lights. So I called people that I knew and let everybody know that I could think of to look outside. And it's different for everyone because I live away from any light. So I'm like ideal for watching Northern Lights. I'm way in but fuck nowhere. <laughs> there ain't no lights um, besides from my own property, which I can control. So that's fine. But some of my friends live in town and of course city lights and street lights and things. So that's like, you know, too bad for them. But I didn't realize how long it was going to go on for. Like I was like, oh, it's happening. And I was, I didn't know if it was going to go away in a second or because I was going to like invite people up. But then at the same time, they get up and it's gone. So anyway, it was just, it was kind of like a last minute panic where I'm like, huh. so I have these like comfortable loungers. I grabbed a blanket, laid on my deck and stared at the sky. And I will say that there were moments where I couldn't believe what was happening. I was so, I guess, 
in disbelief that what I was seeing was actually happening. And because it's so surreal. And at some points, so I'll just be totally honest. The majority of the time, it was bright lights that weren't as purple or green in real life that showed up in photos. Because I even used my own phone to take a photo and it shows up way more vivid green and purple than it was with my own eyes. But if I were to look over to the horizon where you could see like the, the line of the mountains, then I could see that it was a green light and it, or a purple light. So it wasn't like you could see these colors, like what you see in the photo is not what you see in real life. And maybe for some, um, but for me, no. And, <laughs> and I was laying there and at one point there was this divide between the sky where there, all the Northern lights were happening on one side and the other was completely pitch black. It was spectacular. And it, what it looked like to me was that there was a, sh I was looking at the sheer cliff wall of light and I could look farther and farther and farther up the side of this wall. And so it created this like dimension, dimensional like thing in my mind. I'm trying to find the word um, where you almost get vertigo. You almost question your own position. Like, are, are you standing? Are you sitting? Like, you know, when you're looking at something out your window, but it's like actually reflection, but you're trying to look closer at it and everything becomes distorted kind of. I felt very like, what am I seeing? Like, this is insane. And what would people think it was that didn't know what it was? In last podcast, I was talking about dreams and talking about like, when you don't understand what dreaming is, so back in the good old days when people didn't know the actual science behind dreaming and what it is in the brain, like what did they think it was? Like, were they terrified? With Same thing with seeing something you've never seen before, a thunderstorm, you know? But the northern lights, like, spectacular. And there was one point where the center, so I don't know how if it looks the same for everybody that's looking up at the sky because you're, it's so far up there. Um, I'm sure it doesn't because it's actually not as far off as you think, but I'm like, is everybody that's looking up at this right now seeing the same thing or is it different in like, like 50 kilometers away? Of course it makes sense that it would be, but the center would open up into all these like shapes and it was like an eye. It was like an eye that was looking down at us and oh I just can't I should have done like mushrooms or something or or like but actually to be honest I really wanted to experience it in like real life and not have any type of psychedelic where I'd be like oh was it actually like that crazy or was it so I was totally sober <laughs> watching I'm glad I was because I actually I didn't need any type of anything to make it more spectacular I was like blown away with what I saw and also, I went back in, sighed, and then I was really bothered by the fact that I would miss something even crazier because it was like a seven out of nine or something on the scale of intensity for Aurora Borealis. And um, it was very, like, I, I was like, what if it gets crazier and I'd miss it? Like, you know, when you, I love thunderstorms. And there comes a point where you just have to go inside because it's the storm's just over you and it's just like take like it's going on and on and on and it's all great and like oh the thunder can't get any louder. Where you go like right when you go inside and close the door, it's like the biggest bolt of lightning and thunder you've ever heard or seen. So that I was worried, I was like, I have to get back out there. Grabbed a big fluffy blanket, sat on my lounger until one in the morning, but I did fall asleep for like 15 minutes and then wake back up and like remembered. I was like, oh yeah, this is going on. <laughs> and then finally at one, I was like, I got to go to sleep. I got to get up in the morning. And, and, um, of course the next day, the photos were unbelievable. Everybody like local, I, I only go on Facebook for like local updates and things like that. It's just too, I just kind of, creep on there as a stranger and not who I really am but I I like go and uh yeah creep on their photos and oh my god unbelievable and I just wish it was as great 
as the photos show. But even though it wasn't that colorful, it was still spectacular and just something I'll never forget. And apparently the, the following night, so the night that I watched them was a seven out of nine, but the scale goes to nine, I guess. And apparently the following night, the Saturday night was supposed to be a nine out of nine. So all these people, like this was the forecast, right? All these people were getting like parties set up and getting, having hot tub parties, whatever, getting, and you couldn't see them at all. There was one point on Saturday night that I saw them start and then they faded away and I didn't see them again. Apparently by like three or four, there was like some action happening, but it was one tenth as intense as the Friday night. And I feel bad because so many people were so upset they missed them, but then had this hope. Oh my God, it's going to be even crazier tonight. And they just didn't happen. I'm noticing with this cocktail that it does separate a little bit. But that's fine. I guess it must be the lemon in there. I suspect it. What was I talking about when the camera overheated? Northern lights. Anyway, I said what I had to say about them being extremely spectacular. It's the only word I can think of. Okay, so... I, sorry, I have like this itch on my eyelash line. Woo! I uh, last summer bought a few nice cedar trees. Um, and they're kind of like ornamental cedar trees. They're kind of long and skinny, but I have them on either side of my house. They look beautiful. But my landscaper came by and he goes, um, just be careful. He's like, next time you want to buy cedars like that, because I got them from Rona. He's like, next time you want to buy them, like, come to me because, and I was like, oh yeah, come to you. Pfft. No, actually, he's a really great guy. But um, he basically said that sometimes you're buying a dead cedar. It's dead even before you know it is because it takes so long for the leaves or the, the foliage to start to show that it's dead. Uh, and he was so right because I watered the piss out of them. They need lots of water. And... Um, there was nothing that I did wrong. It just happened that they were exactly what he said. Dead. DOA. Dead on arrival. Uh, but they stayed green for most of the summer. They kind of just turned brown a little bit more in the fall, and which was appropriate, I guess. Um, but another thing is, is that even though they were dead and dying, the deer still nibbled them down to nothing. So even if they had survived and lived... The deer still demolish them. So it's like a lose-lose. Even if they were alive, they would they would be dead. And if they were dead, whatever. Basically, that's probably the ninth or tenth time I've said basically in this podcast. Um, they're very difficult to keep, even though I like the look of them. So then I went online and I typed in fake seven-foot cedar trees. And I found a Canadian website called... Silk plant decor and more. And <laughs> that's it's a long website to type in. But they offer um, UV protected fake cedars at seven feet. They were roughly about three hundred dollars Canadian each. I could have I did find them cheaper on Amazon, but not of the same kind of UV protected quality and realism. So they just arrived today and holy crap, they are nice. They look very, very real, but they're seven feet from the base of the planter they come in. So they're actually like six feet. And I was kind of disappointed because the cedars that I had before were seven feet tall, like from the bottom of the, the trunk, because I have them in these barrels, like these great big barrels. So they're really six feet. I'm not going to complain. In my mind, they're going to grow bigger, <laughs> which they never will. Um, but they're beautiful and they're really worth it. Like if you have a deck or a porch or whatever, I highly recommend the fake cedar because you can't tell unless you're literally like two feet away. Um, they're so good. And in the winter time, I never thought about this when I had my other cedars, my real ones but I can light them up and they'll be really beautiful. So I'm uh, excited about them. So I just thought I would talk to you about that, <laughs> that there is the option to have kind of ornamental type trees that aren't real 
that that won't give it away because you know if they're a coniferous tree like that they stay green all year round right so nobody can tell if they're if like a deciduous tree maybe i saw uh <laughs> i saw a video of this guy who owns a cat whose name the cat's name was peaches or something and um he he went into like a a speech about how his name is Peaches, but he never calls her Peaches. He calls her like Weeches and Sneeches and um, like Baby Girl, like all the names that he calls his cat that is not its own name. And I can relate totally because I have a cat named Cheez-It. There's an orange tabby cat. And then a cat named Peach, who is a gray kind of tabby cat. And... I love them both and they all like they, they each have different personalities and Peach is a female, Cheese It is a male, and Peach is like my baby girl. I'm all, I always call her baby girl, Peach, I call her Weech, Weeches, I call her um Peachy Weechy, my cheeky girl. Uh, <laughs> there's probably 15 more. But when I when I talk to her or cheese it, cheese it's like cheesy, cheesy wheezy, wheeze it, um, my naughty boy, <laughs> um, lots of different names. But when I talk to them, I have like a really high pitch, and I I notice that a lot with people that talk to cats or dogs. And this is like not no, new knowledge by any means. Like I think everybody's noticed that, but it's like a tone that you have with your pet. It totally changes. Like if you're talking on the phone, okay, see ya, see ya, buddy. Peachy weechy. You have like a high pitch or you have like a different tone with your pet. And it makes sense because they don't understand what you're saying necessarily. Like they, I'm not, I mean, maybe a lot of them do, but they're not comprehending what you're saying to them in the English language. Like, I love you so much, you beautiful girl. But when you use a tone with them, it's like, that is the language they understand. It's not the words that are coming out of your mouth or the name that you're calling them. It's your like, but that's not true necessarily because I do know that there are commands you can tell dogs that understand. They can understand the difference between this word and that word and that word. They can distinguish, you know, what you're saying or what your command is. But I was like, oh, that makes sense. Like, because it's not the word you're using, you know, you could say to them, I love you so much. You're so beautiful in like a mean way. They're going to not understand what you said. They're going to like take your tone. But I am very, very, very like coddly with my pets. And um, like, it's a bit embarrassed. Like I'm not, if I, if I have neighbors come over and then my cat greets them, I'm like, peachy, peachy girl, like, how are you doing? You know, like I'm like, oh yeah, there's my cat. But it's more of like a personal connection we have that also makes it more special because it's not like like if my family's around I don't care but if I have like clients or guests or whatever I'm not like oh here's my peachy girl <laughs> um so it's but it fulfills my like she we can't really tell each other how much we love each other I can do it through my tone <laughs> <laughs> so is it sound crazy? I know some of you understand what I'm saying. I also recently saw it was something with regard to cloning animals. And then I kind of got, I went down this rabbit hole of animal cloning and how some people, um, oh, it was on Rogan. No, it wasn't. It was another podcast. Anyway, it was determined that it cost around 50000 us dollars to clone your pet they thought it was 15 it was bad friends they were talking about cloning the pet bad friends podcast and uh, they thought it was like fifteen thousand dollars but it actually was like fifty thousand dollars which if you have a beloved pet and you have a lot of money 50 grand all day long like all day long to have your pet back but as long as you understand that even though they have the same genetics they will not have the same personality However, that was the theory, but there was this one girl that, that, um, cloned her boxer dog. And, um, of course the clone was identical looking to her boxer that passed. And she said that he displayed 
like the clone displayed almost all of the same traits as her other dog. And it's hard because even though you you're loving the dog the same, it's still you, you're it's you're usually in different circumstances when you're raising that dog than your original dog. So like if you had a childhood dog that was with you for 30 years, they're going to have a different experience over the next 30. So they they will have different personalities. But I feel like the stories that I've heard, they're very, very, very similar. And, you know, I, to be honest, I'm not a huge dog person. Like I have my dog Felix, but he's an outside dog. He does have his, of course, his heated dog house in the winter time. And he has his like his place to go. And, um, he's very well looked after <laughs> whenever I tell people he's an outside dog. They're like, oh, like you don't let him inside. No, he sheds. Also, I'm just not going to have, I don't have any of my pets in my house, to be honest, my cats or my dog. But, um, you know, my dog Felix has a role and, um, he fulfills that role and he's very happy with what he does, but he's not allowed inside the house. Some people, will hear this, maybe some of you right now, and you're appalled by the fact that we don't let the dog inside. And same with the cats. Because even though you love your cats, it is a bit of a sacrifice to have them inside and have pet hair and scratches and poops and whatever. I also live basically on an acreage and, you know, the cats get the mice and the dogs keep the bear away. And that's just sort of their roles, right? It's like a chicken. You love your chicken, but you just don't, you don't have it in the house. But, and, and for those that do have pets in the house, all for it. I actually do dream about having an indoor cat one day <laughs> that's not going to get hair and everything and like scratch everything to shit. Um, Cause having a pet on your lap on the couch is like a really nice thought. But um, so, like I said, I have nothing against having pets in the house at all, but so I'm not as close, I think, as some people are to their pets. Like, I love them, but I would never take it to the level to clone them to have the same version. However, there are some people that are so close with their pets. They're like their children. They would die without their pets. So I can understand. And I think the first time I ever saw a cloning video was this guy. He has beloved I think it was Chinese um but he was so his pet was his life he did everything for his pet like for for his dog everything like his whole house was designed around like and he had a lot of money and um it was his baby it was like his and then I think he found out she was sick and then eventually went through the process of cloning and Clone And sometimes when you clone a dog or a cat or whatever, you get more than one, you get multiple. And that's where one of these, not that specific story, but there was another story of a guy or no, the girl that cloned her dog, her boxer, I think got two puppies out of it. And I'm like, what? That's crazy. Um, just, you know, to make sure, I guess that they get something out of the mix because maybe one won't make it. Right. But, uh, it's really fascinating and I'm kind of like, I want a more in-depth like documentary from like, I want to see the dog that they're cloning. I want to see its kind of personality, whatever. I want to see the process of the cloning and how much resemblance this puppy has. To, but then I want to see that dog full grown. Like why not clone a pet when it's a baby and then have them kind of grow up next to you and see almost like raise them in different parts of the world and then compare them in like 15 years. Or I guess it'd be a bit of a risky, risky, um, experiment because it's very uncontrolled. And also one might not, might, one might die and then the whole experiment's over, <laughs> but even up to five years, you know, where you clone these dogs, you raise them separately and see how similar they actually are to each other. That would be kind of interesting. But uh, yeah, the idea of cloning is very fascinating to me. Oh, every time I take a sip of that, I'm like happy. <laughs> I think that's pretty much what alcohol does though, right? But it does taste really, really good. Um, what else did I write down to talk about? Okay, so I am heading to 
the Netherlands, Belgium, France. Belgium is just like driving through, um, but renting a car, driving into France, but staying along the coast and heading into Normandy. Uh, I've always wanted to check it out. I'm going to bring my metal detector, metal detector, <laughs> and uh, just do some beach combing and check some places out, enjoy the food. I've been to France before, been to Paris um, years and years ago. Oh my God, 2005, I think. And uh, it was sort of a rush trip because we were kind of on a loop and we were trying to get as many countries in as possible, but not necessarily like as many countries, but we were, we had like, we were going to go here, 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 here. And we only had 10 days to do or something. So you couldn't just relax and cruise and stay in one town for more than one day. It was like, drive right to Paris from there, drive right to Rome from <laughs> So this trip will be more relaxed. I'll be able to really kind of get more into some of the wines of the region and the foods and just the weather. I mean, it's, it's only May, but it can be so beautiful and I hope it is beautiful. Um, and even if it's not, who freaking cares? I'm the kind of person, like I pray for nice weather, but if it's kind of rainy or whatever, I'll make the most of it. And sometimes the weather forces you to go places you wouldn't normally go and you wind up having the best time ever because you were forced in this cafe where you met these people who knew this guy who has a yacht and the next day you're on a boat in the ocean. You're like, that wouldn't have happened if it didn't rain. <laughs> so you have to look at life like that. Okay, this has slowly been, let's see if we can get it. No. Well, I will say the knockoff version could be better, but I'm telling you, you just got to give it a couple tries and just two times in a row already. I have about three that are holding right now, so, but more so. I think the sleeve, this is a bit tougher because if you're like doing this all the time, you're putting more pressure or more tension on these little tiny little tags. But if you have a sleeve or like even the front of my shorts, sometimes I want the shorts longer in the back, but shorter in the front. <laughs> Yours like should be the opposite. But also another really fun thing to do is to like hit markets, like flea markets in Europe. You never know what you're going to find. And the stuff that's so cheap over there would be so expensive over here. And of course, Bringing it back home is not always possible. Uh, it is, but for a price, right? So you might be getting something for $2, but it costs you 50 to bring it back home. You know, that kind of thing. So um, what do I look for in a market, a flea market? I am looking for, I guess I'm super nostalgic about a lot of things because my Opa was a collector of like very tiny miniature things like I don't know it's, it's very eclectic so nothing specific but I love to find like old Wedgwood pieces um, art pieces that I can kind of hang in different parts of the house that really just kind of evoke something in me um, but I'm really just a nostalgia hunter like if I see something that reminds me of my childhood or something like that um, but yeah I don't know I just it's it's almost sad when you go to a flea market, and you see these very old things that used to belong to people like that used to be like lockets or old family photos. You know, I, there's sometimes like shoe boxes of old, really old black and white photos. And it's stacked like these are old family photos probably found in a suitcase somewhere or an estate. You know, somebody was like, oh, they're valuable like nowadays. So they're kind of sought after to these old photos but it's very like, it just pulls at, it pulls at my chest when I'm like seeing some of these family photos that would really be meaningful to maybe somebody, but they're lost, right? There's no name on them. There's no way to tell who these people are. And I have family members that, you know, during the war, their, 
their um, chest full of their family heirlooms were lost because the ship sank, you know, lost forever. And then there's a similar one that's like, you see at a flea market, it looks just like the green chest in the photo, but it's some, it's, you're like, could that be so-and-so's? And then you go and look and no, it's not, but it's like somebody else's that went through the same thing. And it's like, ah, <laughs> it's so, um, I don't know. It's a very heavy feeling. And it's not like that for everybody. And it's not always like that for me, depending on like, you know, the kind of mood I'm in, but it's most of the time, very, um, heavy and kind of like, oh, if only I knew who these people were. And you're so curious, right? And how could somebody sell these things? It's sad as well, because you think about family members that come into possession of these, like, their grandpa or great great grandparents' possessions, and they have no use for an old uniform or old medals or whatever. So they're just getting, you know, it's not their fault. They're just not connected. But then it's like, oh my God, if my opa stuff, like, or my great opa, I would die before I would let anybody take it. Okay, I'm going to end this podcast. I apologize <laughs> for um, the camera cutting out. It is overheated for a third time. I apologize. Um, but let me just finish what I was going to say. I, I would rather die than have somebody, um, be in possession of my family members things. Uh, I'm quite nostalgic and would definitely find a use or a place for, um, these things just to reflect back on and share the history. So that's sort of what I wanted to say. <laughs> Um, but like I said, I understand not everybody has this kind of connection to their family members. And, um, but I do know that some of the things that are found at these flea markets really belong in the hands of people that would really appreciate them. Um, but how do you do it? It's kind of almost impossible, but anyway, well, thank you guys so much for tuning into this episode. I hope that you loved it. Leave your comments down below in the comment section. And also let me know what you think about this podcast. <laughs> uh, no, I was, I was actually trying to say, I'm going to, I'm going to leave the um, ingredients for this cocktail in the description box. So you can make this cocktail as well. Highly recommend drink it though quickly because it's kind of curdling and separating. It definitely doesn't taste the same as when it's freshly cold and freshly made. So that's just my only suggestion. Like this video, subscribe if you are not already. So many of you that are watching this podcast are not subscribed. So it would be great if you could be part of my kitty liquor crew. And I'd love to have you. I'm almost at 2000 subscribers. And that's really, really, really amazing. Uh, you can also follow my main channel, my Cat Wonders channel, where I do lots of try-ons and um, yeah, stay in the loop. So great to have you here. Thank you so much. And I will see you all in the next episode. Bye.